It was the Halloween night of the late 80s, and I was an average 10-year-old boy, living in the eerie suburbs of Cincinnati, Ohio. I had recently taken on a paper route from a friend, thinking it would be a way to make some extra cash during the spooky season. I often imagined a thrilling experience, riding my bike through the shadowy streets, flinging papers onto front porches with a magical paper basket attached to my bike, the newspapers disappearing into the darkness like ghosts. However, reality had a different plan in store. The rule was simple, fold your papers. In practice, I had to walk up to each house and place the paper on their porch, which seemed futile since most suburbanites barely use their front doors, preferring to enter and exit through their garages. My dreams of being a daring paperboy faded into the night. This wasn't a prestigious newspaper like the Cincinnati Inquirer, it was just a small local weekly known as Suburban Scares. Every Halloween night, after the sun went down, would disembark at the end of my street, which led to a dark cul-de-sac, and our house was right at the end. As I approached our house, I'd find two bundles of papers dropped off on our driveway, awaiting my spine-chilling delivery route after a day at school. All I wanted to do was watch spooky movies and indulge in some Halloween candy. Our house sat in the heart of the eerie community. I loaded about half of the papers at a time, making a circuit one way and then returning to grab the rest from a different direction. There were 168 houses in total. That canvas delivery bag they gave me was packed with around 80 papers, enough to make my young shoulders ache. I'd go from one house to another, folding each paper as I went. Fold, then fold again, secure it with the green rubber bands from the bag, and roll it up tight before throwing it on the porch. It quickly became muscle memory. I'm convinced to this day I could do a whole bag blindfolded. My future girlfriend learned a similar skill working at the costume store, folding costumes for display. Some people were friendly, like the lady down the dark street. One Halloween night, she waited on her porch just to thank me for being so prompt in my service. She had just opened a local haunted attraction and had placed an advertisement in the paper that weekend, tipping me $20. There were some perks too. Every paperboy could enter a raffle to win tickets to haunted houses and other spooky attractions. I won passes to The Haunted Mansion and Scream Fest, big deals for a 10-year-old. I would go door-to-door -door collecting payments every month giving them a receipt. I'd tear a small green slip from a notepad, like a cursed note with a discount at a local costume store. For simplicity's sake, I'd ring every bell on the route. If they responded and paid, great. If not, congrats, you got free papers this month. Supposedly, we were supposed to keep track of who paid and who wasn't home the first time, then come back at a later date and time to collect from those who weren't home initially. Yeah. I never did that. So, 168 doorbells rang, and that's long enough. I wouldn't go back over and over. The conversation usually went like this. Hello, I'm collecting for suburban scares. Oh, how much is it? 50 bucks. Then they'd rummage through their pockets, maybe they had it, or they'd leave me there to fetch their wallet or purse. Sometimes, it was a kid, older than me, maybe a high schooler, and they'd vanish for a few minutes. Then they'll dig through their pockets, maybe they have it, or they'll leave me there to get their purse or wallet. Sometimes, it would be a kid older than me, maybe a high school kid, who would disappear for a few minutes to find a dorm. A mix of suburbanites. Just regular. Friendly. About eight months into the job, I went out to collect a spooky Halloween night. My canvas delivery bag slung comfortably over my shoulder, 
filled with collected money, a receipt pad in the side pocket filled with green rubber bands. It was a cold, ominous night, with recent mist and fog rolling in, adding to the haunting atmosphere. I was late that day, so I had to do my work in the dark. We were only halfway through the route when the sky turned into night. But I'm a stubborn little bastard, so I trudged on in the shadows, from yard to yard, grassy paths knee-deep in ghostly mist. I found myself standing in front of a squat, brown two-story building that never seemed to have any life inside. The curtains were always drawn, there were no cars in the driveway, and there was no sign of any lights or activity. It felt like one of those unfriendly houses you see on Halloween with the lights off. You know, the ones that say, no candy, no trick or treating. Out of habit, I stomped the fog off my shoes on the porch and rang the doorbell. I didn't expect anything, like I expected from other houses. There was a short wait, then I heard the latch being released and the door swinging open about a foot and a half. An older woman replied as she stared outside and I gave her my usual Halloween speech. She paused, and after a long moment, he looked past me and said vaguely, Oh, this is going to take me a moment. With a toothy old lady smile on his face. Why don't you go in and warm up while you wait? I don't like this idea. When I was a kid I only went to one other house while collecting and I knew who lived there. But that's just an old lady, right? I was led into the dim hallway and she closed the door behind me with a little force, the latch clicking into place. She walked past me without a word and staggered down a dark corridor into the depths of the house, leaving me alone in the corridor. I immediately noticed it was warm inside, like you get when you come in from the cold. Especially my face, cheeks and ears felt the warmth. The second thing I noticed was that I was not alone. In a room to my left, there was something like a living room, shrouded in darkness. There were five or six people living in it, both men and women, all middle-aged. They were dressed casually, in coats and sweaters, and dressed as if they were going to a spooky costume party. They all stood quite far apart from each other in the near darkness. All of them were facing me, looking at me, staring at me. Each of them remained motionless and completely silent. There seemed to be no noise in the house. Time has passed and continues to pass. There was no movement. There is no sound. A silent house. Time feels suspended. Then they began to move as one, slowly. Look at it from both sides. In the late 1990s, my family moved to a picturesque waterfront property on a tranquil island just across the water from the bustling city of Seattle. Our new home was nestled at the end of a quiet road, and the island was imbued with a unique sense of isolation. A weathered pier extended into the water, adding to the charm of our surroundings, and directly across from us sat a retirement home. This building, now filled with elderly residents, had a hidden history as a former boarding school. The original dormitory building of the boarding school still stood, a relic of the past, and beside it lay an abandoned and exceedingly dilapidated bungalow. The promise of adventure and curiosity led my friends and me to explore these enigmatic structures. In our youthful exuberance, we felt like pre-teen detectives on a thrilling case. As we approached the aging dormitory, we couldn't help but notice the shattered windows on the ground floor. Through the jagged glass fragments, we could discern what appeared to be broken plates and the distant silhouette of a stage. Being an ardent theater enthusiast, I was eager to venture inside. However, one of the other girls in our group began to exhibit increasing agitation. She expressed a deep sense of foreboding, uttering, 
I don't think we should do this, guys. I have a really bad feeling about this, guys. Unfortunately, we couldn't locate another point of entry, all the doors were securely locked, and every window had a drop-down barrier. Our luck improved when we reached the dilapidated bungalow. Its door was hanging off its hinges, inviting us to enter. Upon crossing the threshold, we were confronted with the aftermath of what seemed to be a fire or some other calamity. The walls were stripped down to the studs, every surface was smudged black with soot, and there were gaping holes in the floor. The air inside was stifling and had an uncanny thickness to it, as if we were swimming through it. Despite observing a room with fresh periwinkle blue walls through an exterior window, we couldn't pinpoint its location once we were inside the bungalow. The inexplicable discrepancy between what we saw from the outside and what we encountered within puzzled us. There were no doors along the wall that should have shared a connection with the blue room. When we ventured outside to scrutinize it again, we realized that we couldn't identify any doors from the blue room either. It was a perplexing enigma that left us disoriented. A few nights later, all my friends gathered at my house for a sleepover. At around 2 am, I abruptly awoke with an overwhelming sensation of suffocation. It felt as if an invisible weight pressed down on my chest, immobilizing me. In the dim room, I shared a bed with one of my friends, while the others lay scattered across the floor. Struggling to turn my body to the right, I was suddenly confronted by an unsettling sight. A seventh girl was perched on my dresser, a girl who shouldn't have been there. She had dark hair and wore a black dress resembling a pinafore. Her boots tapped rhythmically against my dresser. The sight jolted me awake, and I was finally able to bolt upright, close my eyes, and shake my head in disbelief. When I mustered the courage to look again, she had vanished. I dismissed it as a vivid nightmare, but the lingering unease stayed with me. A couple of days later, we met at the Island Historical Museum for further investigation. It was there that we discovered the boarding school's intriguing history. Founded in the 1870s as an all-girls finishing school, the institution had once been a hub of education and social development on the island. The pier at the end of our road served as a vital transport link to the city. My house, it turned out, stood on the former playing fields of the school, while the bungalow was originally the groundskeeper's residence. However, we couldn't unearth any blueprints or records to explain the elusive blue room. Instead, we stumbled upon a haunting photograph from the 1890s. The old black and white school portrait depicted two rows of girls dressed in pristine white gowns, seated in front of the abandoned dormitory building. Curiously, one student's name was missing from the list of names below the image. In the front row, one girl was captured looking down at her foot, which had been stepped on by the girl beside her. The girl who had stepped on her foot was unmistakable, she had dark hair, wore a black pinafore-like dress, and had boots on. Her name? Girl Unknown. In the years that followed, I found myself revisiting those enigmatic buildings, occasionally to smoke some weed, but I dared not venture inside again. Once I acquired a cell phone, I realized there was no cellular service in the bungalow or the dorms, which dissuaded me from returning altogether. Years later, my brother and his friends explored the house, but he now adamantly refuses to return. They claim to have heard piercing screams emanating from within the walls, leaving us all haunted by the mysteries that shrouded those structures. The tale unfolded in the heart of a small South American town, against the backdrop of the mid-1970s. In a close-knit community, my parents, a young married couple, resided next door to my dad's sister, Carmen. Carmen, too, 
was married and had two young children. The whole family thrived together, and life seemed idyllic. Yet, as time passed, Carmen yearned for more than homemaking. She longed for a job that would give her a sense of purpose beyond the household. Thanks to her network of friends, Carmen secured a job at the local post office. But the question of who would care for her two active boys remained. The answer arrived in the form of Maria, a demure and shy teenager of about 14 or 15. Maria came from a modest family residing on the outskirts of town, enduring financial struggles for years. She'd been pulled out of school to help with her younger siblings and various household chores. The job opportunity presented by my Aunt Esther and her husband, Justin, was a godsend for Maria. Maria possessed an uncanny gift for taming unruly children. She had a natural talent for soothing, entertaining, and caring for Carmen's lively boys. It was a perfect fit for the family, as Maria quickly formed a strong bond with the children. Carmen and Justin were thrilled, and life seemed harmonious once more. But this newfound peace was destined to be short-lived. Strangeness began to infiltrate their household. It commenced innocuously with small, everyday items inexplicably vanishing. Cutlery, socks, underwear, and even appliances such as the handheld radio and coffee maker disappeared, only to be unearthed buried in the sandy beach behind their home. On one peculiar occasion, the family dogs unearthed a long line of knotted socks and underwear, creating an eerie spectacle in their backyard. Suspicions naturally turned towards Maria. However, her bewilderment mirrored that of the family, as she professed her innocence. Days and weeks passed, and a new menace began to haunt the household. The town's erratic power supply only added to their woes. Scheduled blackouts cast neighborhoods into darkness multiple times a week, and unscheduled outages were a common occurrence. By 6.30 p.m., the town would be enveloped in inky darkness, illuminated solely by the flicker of candlelight. This set the stage for a peculiar twist in their tale, for Halloween was just around the corner. Halloween night arrived, and Carmen decided to open the windows to invite a breath of fresh, eerie air into the candlelit house. The electric company's power schedule was unforgiving, and darkness enveloped their world. Maria and the children eagerly anticipated Halloween's playful spookiness, but little did they know that real terror awaited them. That night, the house was besieged by a barrage of rocks hurled through the open windows. The intrusions brought pandemonium to their Halloween festivities. Armed with flashlights, my uncle Justin and my dad scoured the perimeter of their property, hunting for the elusive pranksters, but their searches turned up nothing. The house was fortified by a towering seven-foot fence, with padlocked gates from within, making intrusion seemingly impossible. Yet, the rocks continued to rain down, seemingly from thin air. As days turned to weeks, daylight hours remained uneventful. Maria often found herself alone with the boisterous children. The daily routine carried on as usual, but the nightly hauntings intensified. Not only did rocks continue to assail the house, but candles were now snuffed out by unseen forces. Desperation set in, prompting my uncle to seek aid from the neighbors. Even the local police were called upon to help patrol the property. Yet, the intrusions proved unstoppable. The dogs would erupt into a frenzied barking fit, barking at shadows in the night, but no intruders could ever be seen. In this surreal Halloween nightmare, the neighbors began suggesting that the family needed more than earthly assistance. A priest was called upon to bless their home and cleanse it of malevolent spirits. Reluctantly, my uncle agreed, 
entertaining the possibility that the source of their torment might be something supernatural. The priest arrived, accompanied by a group of indigenous men. But these indigenous men, gripped by fear, refused to set foot on the property. They remained outside, shouting, the devil, the devil, in dread. The priest embarked on his blessing and cleansing ritual, but the haunting showed no signs of abating. If anything, the supernatural activity intensified. One eerie Halloween night, while my uncle and the neighbors maintained their vigil in the yard, the family dogs abruptly turned their ferocious barking toward Maria's room. Every flashlight turned to focus on that location, but the search yielded nothing, as was the usual case. Fearing for the safety of the women and children inside, my uncle Justin and my dad decided to check on Maria. They knocked on her door, but she hesitated to let them in, growing increasingly suspicious. They ended up kicking her door open, and a pungent stench hit them as they stepped into the darkness. Maria was sitting on her bed, attempting to conceal an appalling pile of feces, something grotesque and seemingly inhuman in scale. A thorough search of her room, including under the bed and in the closet, yielded no sign of Maria. She refused to speak, offering only the cryptic defense, it wasn't me. Outside, the dogs continued their frenzied barking, and the rocks were thrown with even greater ferocity, smashing windows and sowing chaos. The neighbors were still outside, watching helplessly, as rocks seemed to emerge from all directions. The chilling truth had become undeniable, Maria was inexplicably linked to the haunting. The following day, my Aunt Esther and Uncle Justin drove Maria back to her family home. Initially, her parents played dumb, but they soon broke down and confessed that since the onset of her adolescence, Maria had been relentlessly haunted by an unknown presence. The family had moved several times in the hopes of escaping these inexplicable events, but the torment followed them wherever they went. Items disappeared from their house, only to be found buried, and rocks continued to be hurled at night. In the end, my aunt and uncle returned home, and just like that, everything went back to normal. The haunting presence of Maria had dissipated, and the ominous Halloween memories began to recede. Yet the story continued to be whispered in the small town's shadows, an unexplained tale that left an indelible mark and, on Halloween nights, sent shivers down spines. It was a story where the line between the natural and supernatural blurred, creating an enigma that defied explanation.